following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. We've reached the fourth lecture of a series. In the previous lectures, we introduced an explanation of what meditation is and is not. Meditation, properly defined, is a state of consciousness. It's a state of being. And in that sense, it's something that is natural and inherent to all living things. It is the state of consciousness when it is unfiltered, unconditioned, in its natural state, without any interference on its ability to perceive and understand. And that's the real nature of the consciousness itself. It is the basis of perception and understanding. So as we are now, our perception and our understanding are filtered. They are conditioned by many factors. In order for us to experience the state of meditation, we need to remove the consciousness from the conditioning. And when we can successfully do that, we then spontaneously and naturally experience the state of meditation. So you could say that the, the correct attitude to develop the skill to meditate properly is not to focus attention on trying to reach the state of meditation, but instead to remove the obstacles that prevent it. This is a very significant difference because most people who study meditation are seeking the state of meditation. They're seeking an experience, a sensation. They want to feel something or not feel something. Some people will go to meditation studies and practice to escape. And those who are chasing after a sensation or an experience will always be disappointed because meditation realistically and truthfully doesn't work that way. So in the first few lectures, we explained that. Today, we're going to take those principles a little bit further and we're going to talk about action how we actually create a trajectory or a movement in the whole of our life so that we can become very skilled at accessing the state of meditation. And it has to be approached in that way. The state of meditation cannot be accessed unless one devotes everything to it. And that sounds extreme, but it really does work that way. It's a lifestyle. It is a, it is a very fundamental change in how we behave from moment to moment, how we engage the consciousness, how we utilize our energy, and how we utilize our perception. All of that united and working together is what allows the circumstances to change so that the state of meditation becomes more easily accessed.
more easily experienced. If we don't make those fundamental changes, we will never be able to enter that state at will. We might be able to enter it occasionally by accident. And this is what happens with most people who learn meditation practices. They may learn how to sit. They may learn a mantra. They may learn a posture. They may learn certain types of techniques and rigorously work with them. But because they don't modify the other 23 hours of their daily life, they cannot access the state of meditation at will, but only by accident occasionally. So they may go months, years of trying to meditate even on a daily basis and failing to access that state and become frustrated and abandon their practice. This is extremely common, but it doesn't have to be that way. If they learn to train their attention for the remaining time of the day that they are not actively sitting and practicing meditation, then when they actually do sit to practice meditation, it will be easy because they've already been training all day and all night in preparation. So that's why today's lecture is called Action. And to understand what we mean by action, we are going to look at a slide which depicts this image from Tibetan Buddhism of the stages of meditative concentration. This image is very famous and it's something we've discussed many times already. And it's presented to all the beginners in Tibetan Buddhist practice and, and uh, the different traditions of Tibetan Buddhism. It depicts a gradual process through which the one who wants to access the state of meditation works on modifying their relationship with their own psyche. This teaching, this explanation of the stages of meditative concentration was given by the Buddha Maitreya. So it is a reliable teaching. It is a very profound teaching. It is also a beginner level teaching. It's something that sets forth some basic principles that are really useful for anyone who's trying to understand what meditation is and also to understand where we are in relationship to reaching that experience and being able to sustain it and reach it at will. In general, this graphic represents densities. At the very bottom is the wildest quality of mind, the mind that is the most out of control, most chaotic, the most painful. And the one who's steadily advancing in their efforts sees that the mind, represented by the animals, gradually become under control. They become stable. They become manageable. Until at the very top, we see that this monk who represents the person who's learning to meditate has a, a mind, a psyche, that serves the interest of the meditator, rather than being an opponent, rather than being a wild animal, it becomes a loyal friend. And this progression from the wild animal to the loyal friend is something very scientific. It doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen by wishing or believing. It happens because of action very specific action, knowing how to perform the right acts at the right stages and done in sequence so that this consequence naturally arrives. On the broad scale, when we study meditation, we understand that when we seek to understand meditation, we're trying to transform our current chaotic state, a state of not knowing and a state of pain and suffering 
into a state in which we can access profound insight into our fundamental problems. And that process is outlined in Buddhism as having three essential stages. And these are called three trainings. And they are Shila, Samadhi, and Pranya. And in English, simple terms are ethics, ecstasy, and profound wisdom. But those English words don't convey the full meaning of the Sanskrit words. The goal is prajna, which means profound wisdom. But it isn't the wisdom you can acquire from books. It is an active intelligence. It is a living force. And in Kabbalah, it is called Bina. It is called Hokma. And it is called Keter. It has three faces or three aspects. And in Kabbalah, it's represented by the three supernals. In Greek, the three Logoi or Logos that are written about in the Bible. And those three aspects are, of course, a trinity represented in all religions that in Buddhism are called the Trikaya. And these are the fundamental bodies of any awakened being, which in Buddhism is called a Buddha. But it includes any awakened being. At the highest levels has this intelligence, a type of wisdom, a type of understanding that is far beyond anything that our intellect can conceive of. That is what is indicated by prajna. It is this type of penetrating wisdom that can cut through to the substantial heart of anything. It is the wisdom mind of a Buddha, of the greatest masters that you can imagine. So meditation is the process through which we learn to access that in ourselves. And obviously, that's a very tr transformative, powerful thing. And it cannot happen by accident. It happens through action. Specific scientific actions. To reach it, one must know how to access the second of the two trainings, which is samadhi. In English, we translate that as ecstasy. It is not a physical ecstasy. It is not any type of sensation related to the physical senses. What ecstasy means, what samadhi means, is a state of consciousness in which the very essence of ourselves, the purest heart of who we are, is liberated from its conditioning, even for an instant. That purest essence of who we are, our soul, if you want to call it that, Tathagatagarbha, Buddha nature, many names for that element when it is out of the bottle, free of the cage, outside of the hell that it's trapped in now, it feels ecstasy, liberation, happiness, joy. But it is a perceptive, active, living state. It isn't something vague and vaporous, elusive and insubstantial. It is more real than our physical life. It is an actual experience of our true self, our true nature. That's why it's called ecstasy. It's an ecstasy of the soul, an ecstasy of the consciousness. Only in that state, completely free of anger, of lust, of pride, of fear, of trauma, of any desire, can the essence of ourselves, the consciousness, then perceive clearly and have prajna, that profound wisdom. And see the heart, the true meaning, the true understanding, the true cause of things. <clears throat> it's rather obvious when you look at that. It makes sense. If we're trapped in anger and pride, then everything we see is filtered by the anger and pride. If we're trapped in our pain and our suffering and our lust and our envy, we cannot see the truth. We can only see through the filters of those desires. So by liberating the consciousness from those desires, 
Having this state of ecstasy, which is the second training, we can then access the third training, which is prana. In its heart, this is why we want to know how to access the state of meditation. The state of meditation is the doorway to samadhi. When I say the state of meditation, I'm talking about a specific technical term that's in all the traditions of meditation, but of course, each in its own language. Sanskrit is called dhyana. That word dhyana has become many other words as the teachings of meditation spread around the world. It became chan, and chan in China became zen in Japan. And that word dhyana has a very deep and significant meaning because it means absorption. It means meditation when you translate it directly. And it is a state of consciousness. So when we look at this map of all the stages of concentration, dhyana is all the way at the top. It is a state of absorption in which the consciousness is able to fully and completely see without filters. And it's at that precipice of entering samadhi, which is the ecstasy, leaving the bottle of the body and the mind. So the state of meditation is our initial goal to reach that state of dhyana. And when we can reach that, samadhi is right there. And we see samadhi represented in this flying monk. This is the ecstasy, that joy of being free, of flying in the heavens, nirvana. Now, the three trainings of Buddhism, just like in Ashtanga from Patanjali in the Hindu tradition, you can only reach samadhi, that ecstasy, through dhyana, which is the absorption and you can only reach that through the first of the three trainings, which is Shila, ethics. And of course, this is the step that everybody wants to skip. Everybody who studies meditation wants to skip over the ethics and think, oh, I'm smart enough, I can just skip that part and go straight to Samadhi. And I'm sort of frustrated, so I'm going to come up with my own way to do that. So people study all these different books and traditions and think they're going to make up their own way. And they don't. Or they get tied up into some schools that teach them to use drugs or to use sex or to use alcohol or to use other types of stimulants in order to propel themselves into states of ecstasy. And what they fail to realize is that they're breaking the first training. They are not abiding by ethics. So instead of liberating themselves from conditioning, they're adding to their conditioning. They become alcohol addicts. They become drug addicts. They become sex addicts. They indulge themselves in all their desires and think through that indulgence they will understand and liberate themselves. And they're wrong. And the proof is in their lives. Traditional meditation practice in every country, in every tradition in the world starts with ethics. You cannot skip it. If you really want to learn meditation, you cannot skip that stage. And there's a reason. Ethics don't mean do what we tell you. That's not the meaning of ethics. That's morality. That's completely separate. We're not talking about morality. We're talking about the actions that we perform with our consciousness and the consequences of those actions. If the actions we perform physically, emotionally, and mentally produce conditioning for the consciousness, those actions must be abandoned because they contradict our goal of reaching samadhi and prana. Stated another way, if we look at this graphic, we see this monk at the beginning, and running away is this elephant and the monkey. And the elephant and monkey represent aspects of our wild mind. And if we're letting that wild mind do whatever it wants, chase its lust, its interest in sensations like food, alcohol, women, men, TV, video games, buying things, selling things, whatever it is that gets us excited and, and uh, fascinated, 
then that animal will just keep running because it's taking all of our energy. We're letting it be in charge. That is why ethics are essential to begin the path. It is through our ethics, through knowing how action and consequence work in us, that we begin to calm the wild energy that dominates our lives. And so for that, we have to understand action and consequence. Action and consequence. This is an immutable, infallible law of nature. And it is existing and dominating and providing the basis of existence in every level of nature without any exception. Many people nowadays think that we can do whatever we want and we should do whatever we want because we're going to die anyway. So what's the point? Might as well do what we want before we die. But those people, of course, are deeply ignorant of the truth. The reality is every action we perform has a consequence that affects us. And that is true no matter what level of nature we live in. Of course, we understand that we live in the physical world, which on this graphic from the Kabbalah is related to this world, Malkut, the lowest of those 10 spheres. But that sphere is in the middle of the heavens, which are above it, and the hells, which are below it. And this is something that's taught in every religion and mystical tradition in the world. We are in this in-between place, and every religion tells us that according to our actions, we will receive our due. The Bible says, whatever you uh, sow, you will reap. And of course, in Asian philosophy, everyone knows about karma. But that word karma doesn't mean punishment. It means action. And it's understood that every action has a consequence. So this is the first fundamental truth about action and consequence we have to understand. It is a law. It is not optional. It doesn't only apply if God is watching. It applies to everything in every instant. Every movement of your body produces a consequence. And nowadays, the interesting thing is that the physicists who study quantum mechanics and these other very uh, perplexing aspects of nature have come to realize that even the tiniest, seemingly insignificant movement can produce consequences in the rest of the universe. And this is boggling the minds of physicists and mathematicians. And so there's this famous statement that the, the fluttering of a butterfly's wing can cause a catastrophe on the other side of the world. And mathematically and scientifically, it's already demonstrated. And yet we refuse to hear it. We still persist in this idea that whatever we do, there's no consequence. But all these levels, from the most dense level of nature all the way to the most subtle level of nature, all of them exist because of cause and effect. All of them. And we are just mites of dust drifting through this incredibly complex and beautiful universe, also subject to action and consequence, but we ignore it. So the first thing that we learn when we enter any genuine tradition, at the most basic level, we call it the Sutrayana level or the beginning level, is this first thing, action and consequence. It's the most fundamental thing to comprehend about your life. Everything you do has consequences. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. There are consequences for every action. That's an immutable, infallible law of nature. So the second important fact is that the effects of any action are always greater than the action that produced it. 
Now this is another aspect of action that people just completely ignore or get really confused about. But it's not hard to demonstrate. Here's a simple way to test this. When you go next to your job or to your family or to a community, experiment with your tone, with your behavior, with your attitude, or just observe it. Notice how if you come in smiling and happy, that simple choice affects everyone else. That little smile, that act of kindness affects other people far, far, far more than the energy it took to produce that smile. And the same is true if you come into a place storming in anger. That anger will affect people and reverberate like an echo in ways that you can't even perceive. It affects everyone in profound ways. And the same is true of all the other psychological qualities we have. The effects that we radiate physically, emotionally, and mentally are far greater than the initial action. And we can relate this to the simple idea that if you pick up a stone and toss it into a lake, that little action doesn't cost much energy to perform it. But that stone striking the water can create ripples that go for miles. And it can affect every living thing in that lake and be heard by other creatures for miles and miles. It's a simple thing. But this happens with everything that we do on levels that we can't perceive with our physical senses. Effects are greater than the cause. The third aspect of action is that you cannot receive the consequence without committing its corresponding action. Another place that we are deeply ignorant. Everyone thinks they're going to heaven. Without exception. Everyone thinks that when we die, we're going to go to heaven and God will welcome us with open arms and all of our family and loved ones will be there waiting for us and everything's going to be great. We fail to realize that the level of the heavens, of the nirvanas, are the levels of gods, angels. Those beings don't have lust. They don't have anger. They don't have envy, like we do, jealousy like we do, fear like we do, pride like we do. They have their own issues, but they don't have the animal bestiality, the cruelty, the violence, the potential to harm others, to harm ourselves, that we do. They are not liars like us, murderers, rapists, killers, thieves, like we are. All of those qualities that we have cannot go to the superior world. They don't belong there. Those qualities are demonic. They abide in the lower realms. Whatever is heavy sinks. Whatever is light rises. This is what happens when we die. We are drug along by the trajectory of our level of being. By the quality of our stream of consciousness. If in our mind constantly flowing and influencing us are all of our desires and fears and anger and pride and lust and all those qualities. When we die, that's exactly what's going to pull us along through the internal world. It's all of those qualities. We receive the consequences of our condition, particularly because we are always acting on those conditions. The anger that rises up, we act on it. We don't control it. We don't destroy it. We indulge in it. We feel justified to be angry. The lust comes up, we satisfy it. We let it rule our body, our heart, and our mind. Envy, we feel justified that what other people have, we deserve. So we act on our envy. We don't understand that envy is demonic. And we don't understand that we will receive the consequences of having that envy. Furthermore, 
Once an action is performed, it can't be erased. This is another place we are deeply ignorant. We think as long as no one sees us do it, we can do whatever we want. Or even if people see us, who cares? We're still going to do what we want to do, and who cares? We'll, we'll, in the end, right before we die, we'll, we'll beg God forgiveness, and we'll accept Jesus as our Savior, and we'll go to heaven anyway. So we can just do whatever we want up until the moment we die. And right at the last minute, the priest will come and say, I forgive you, my son, and you can go on to heaven now. It doesn't work like that. Every action has consequences, and those consequences are severe because you see the effects are greater than the cause. The second law here. Every action we perform has a profound reach. It isn't the way we want it to be. It is the way it is in nature. Now, these all sound dire and scary, and when people hear about them, they get very uncomfortable and don't want to hear anymore and want to go somewhere where they're going to be made to feel better. But the truth is, these four fundamentals of action are laws of nature. They aren't good or bad. They just are what they are. But for someone who has training, we can turn these four to our advantage. This law of action and consequence is what makes liberation possible. It is the very salvation of ourselves if we use it wisely. If instead of indulging in bad behaviors, desired anger, lust, and all the other qualities that cause suffering, if instead we choose to adopt a superior way of being, then we take advantage of these laws. Superior actions receive effects greater than the cause, and they bring the consequences of superior actions. And once the action is performed, it can't be erased. This is how we start to tip the scales in our favor. Now these four qualities of action are explained in the Lam Rim by Tsongkhapa, who is an incredibly important master of the Buddhist tradition. But what was not explicitly stated as one of the laws is the fifth, which is that a superior law always overcomes an inferior law. This is implicit in all Buddhism, in all Hinduism, in all Christianity, in all Judaism, that if you perform a superior action, you can overcome your mistakes. If you choose to adopt a higher way of being, to take the higher path, to renounce the actions that cause suffering, and to begin to perform the actions that produce happiness, that produce liberation. So now we need to study how that happens in our moment-to-moment -moment experience. In this tradition, we talk about the line of life. And you could say this is the line of time because it applies to us while we are incarnated in a body. But it also applies to us from existence to existence. So this line of life, while we talk about it from the context of birth to death, it actually extends far beyond those two points. And this is because energy does not die. Energy only changes. This is something Einstein pointed out. Energy does not die. It simply changes form. So all of the energy that we've put in motion through our moment-to-moment -moment actions throughout our lifetime, where does that energy go when we die? The physical body dies, but all of that energy is still moving. And that's what produces our next existence. The subject of that, the discussion of that, we've taught in several courses before that you can study if you are interested. The key thing is we're incarnated right now in a physical body. We have this incredible machine that has incredible power. And if we are smart, we can utilize that physical matter 
to transform energy in a very powerful way to produce incredible change. In the previous lecture, we were talking about energy and all the types of energy that are present on the scale of nature. But simply looking at it from a physical point of view, all of us know that a few decades ago, the scientists here figured out how to take a single atom and split it and liberate energy. And it, from that one atom comes an incredible amount of energy, enough to destroy a city and kill a lot of people, which is a terrible use of energy. But if you contemplate that just briefly, you'll realize that your physical body is filled with uncountable atoms. And mathematically speaking, it is also therefore filled with an unimaginable amount of energy. Truly unimaginable energy in you right now. But it is latent. It is passive. It is not accessed. Through the process of developing the consciousness, you learn to access that energy, but only in accordance with your ethics. That energy is an incredible, terrible power. And it is only given out to those who earn it. Now, this is stepping aside a little bit from the scientific approach that we are approaching meditation from. But I'm mentioning it because that energy, which is in levels and levels throughout nature, is in us for a reason, because we have a reason to be alive. We have a reason to exist. And if you persist in meditation and learning meditation, you will discover it. The bottom line is, all of us are steadily, from instant to instant, approaching death. And we have not yet realized our purpose. We have not accessed that energy. And we are in a condition in which we suffer terribly. Death is arriving. We don't know when. Could be today. Could be tomorrow. This is an unknown to us. And from moment to moment, from instant to instant, the distance between us and death is shrinking. Every expenditure of energy is advancing us. But we don't know whether we are raising our level of being, lowering our level of being. We don't know. So we study an additional line here, which is the line of being. That line is vertical. And it is intersecting us exactly in this moment. In every moment, according to our condition psychologically, we have a level of being. That level of being is the vertical line through this graphic of the heavens and hells. Where do we vibrate as a psyche, as a soul? What are the conditions? What are the qualities of our mind? If our mind is heavily conditioned by doubt, by fear, by resentment, by envy and jealousy, and all those types of qualities, then our level of being is very low. It's in the demonic levels, the animal levels. Very low. Those qualities belong to demons, devils, and all the beings that are in hell. And honestly, when we all are very sincere with ourselves, we'll see that that is the case for humanity. Humanity is not an advanced civilization. It's a very animalistic, very cruel, very violent civilization who doesn't have any interest in profoundly developing generosity or chastity or patience or conscious love. The society has no interest in that. Our society wants sex and money and to rule others, to dominate others. That's all animal. That's demonic. And we all have that. So our level of being as a, as a world and as individuals is very low on the scale of things. The thing is that if we take advantage of action, 
and we choose to take another path to instead adopt positive behaviors and advance ourselves from moment to moment by choosing superior types of action, superior actions physically, emotionally, and mentally. And we can raise our level of being little by little, step by step, from moment to moment, consciously choosing to take control of this animal, the mind, to dominate that animal, to train it, and convert it from an adversary into a helper. That is a difficult process, but it can be done. It has been done, and it will be done by anyone who takes this seriously. Those levels have specific importance, practical importance, because we will receive what we sow. If from moment to moment we're persisting and acting in negative ways, selfish ways, ways that hurt ourselves and others, the consequence will be that our terrestrial life now will get worse and worse. We will suffer more and more. And then when we die, that trajectory will continue. We will be born into more and more painful circumstances. This is a law of nature. But if we choose to take the higher path, renounce those harmful behaviors and adopt beneficial ones, then that trajectory will begin to go up. And if we work really hard to transform the mind, then when we die, we will receive the consequences of our actions. We can earn a vacation, you might say, in the superior worlds after we die, a visit to paradise or heaven. We can even earn residence there if we work really hard on ourselves. Now, all of this has uh, importance to our meditation practice now. We're talking about a longer scale thing, yes, the greater context of our life. But these laws apply to our daily meditation practice. If when we meditate, we want to experience the superior levels, then we have to produce the consequences through our actions. The experience of nirvana, of samadhi, of entering the heavenly realms, of going out of the body and all of that, those are just the consequences of actions. It's scientific. They don't happen by accident. They happen because of cause and effect. So if our interest is to reach samadhi and reach prana, to go out of the body, to enter into the nirvanic realms, to experience the heavens, to see for ourselves the beings that reside in those places. We can do it, but we must produce the actions that create that result. So in our meditation practice, we can apply this teaching. If we are afflicted with pain, with anger, with resentment, with doubt, with fear, those qualities will take us to hell. They belong to hell. If we want to be free from them, we have to see them for what they are and get out of them. We have to adopt superior action. Similarly, if we want to enter the superior levels, we have to comprehend the cage that we're in. It is a matter of perception. You see, this graphic of the tree of life, this Kabbalistic image, maps our psyche. When we sit to meditate, we are in our physical body. Most people, when they practice meditation, remain in their physical body. They may have music playing, incense burning. They may have somebody talking next door or a, bar, a dog barking next door. And so they sit and they look like they're meditating, but really they're listening to all those sounds. They're smelling the incense. They're feeling the pain in their back or their knee or their leg. And their attention is 100% absorbed 
in the physical sensations. That's why they never experience the state of meditation. Because they are producing the action that results in staying in the physical body. They aren't adopting a superior way of behaving. Some people who become relaxed enough and begin to extract attention from the physical senses can start to feel other types of sensations. They may feel like they're starting to blow up like a balloon. They may feel like they become extremely heavy or extremely light. They may feel that even though they can feel the physical body, they also feel like they are leaning to one side or another. And it feels strange. This person is starting to extract their attention from physicality and are becoming aware of the energy of that body, which is in Kabbalah called Yasod, the foundation. And that's the foundation of the physical body. It's the body of Chi, the vital body. Someone who is able to relax further then becomes more attuned to what's happening with them emotionally. They may start to see images, start to see visions. And this is related with the astral realm, the world of dreams. More subtle is thought. More subtle is will. More subtle is consciousness. More subtle than that is spirit. There is a progression the meditator who is very careful in using attention, who wants to enter into the superior worlds, does it simply this way. Extract attention from the senses. Let go of the physical body. Leave it alone. Let it rest. Forget about it. Take all the attention inside. Shut the physical senses down. In other words, we extract the consciousness from the physical body. Same with the body of energy. We no longer pay attention to what's happening with us energetically. Heat, cold, sleep, seeing things, all the types of sensations or subtle vibrations we can feel energetically. We don't pay attention to that. We extract attention from that. We dive deeper within. Emotions, emotional qualities arising and falling, even imagery, dreams, fantasies, memories, all these things that start floating about that seem somewhat vague and, and odd that are like dreams, we also extract attention from that, not distracted by it, not paying attention to it, withdrawing from it. And thus we take the consciousness out of the astral body. Thought. Thoughts flow in and out. Associative thinking. I remember this, that reminds me of this. This happened and that happened. I've got to remember to pay the bills. I've got to go here. I've got to go there. And then she said this and he said that. All that associative thinking, we extract attention from that as well. We don't pay attention to it anymore. We withdraw from it. It might still happen, but it doesn't distract us. So we extract the consciousness from the mental body. We're arriving at more and more subtle levels of the psyche till we reach the point where we're dealing with just willpower. Just willpower. It's not a thought, it's not a feeling. It is just will. And even there, we can extract attention, a consciousness from that, and escape even that level and go deeper. This process of extracting attention, withdrawing, is the same process of entering into the heavenly worlds in levels and levels and levels. The more you can withdraw the consciousness from each of these conditions, the higher you can go in your absorption states, in your samadhi. So I'm giving you a preview of what is possible when you develop some skill. Anyone can do this. It's just a matter of producing the action. Here and now, we start with working with our moment-to-moment -moment experience, understanding how all of those things are affecting us right now. When we become aware of them, then we can start to extract attention from them and controlling the animal mind. So we talk about five centers. 
The intellectual is very obvious. It's where we think. It's related with our physical brain. The emotional center is also obvious. It's related with our heart, the center of our chest. It's where we feel emotions. The motor, instinctual, and sexual brain, or these three centers that make up that brain, are more subtle. But if we observe ourselves, we can see how they behave also. The motor center is where we learn behaviors, how to move the body, how to drive a car, how to walk, how to run, how to use a keyboard and a mouse, a computer, how to perform our job. Those are motor skills. The instinctual center is at the base of the spinal column, and that's where our instinctual behaviors are controlled from. There's a center of intelligence there that manages all those animal instinctive types of behaviors, like preservation of life. And then finally, the, the most powerful and the most difficult to deal with is the sexual center, which is the one that creates all of these other ones. We are born through sex, and we are uh, controlled, ultimately, constantly, in every way, by the sexual energy. So, all of these centers relate to this map of the Tree of Life, and the different qualities that I just briefly went through with you. The main thing is that we are using them right now to act. And the way we use them produces consequences. So if our goal is to learn to meditate and to experience the state of meditation and to take advantage of that state to get wisdom about our lives, about our problems, about our purpose, about our future, it all starts here, right now, in this moment, in that intersection between those two lines, the line of life and the line of being. This instant, now, what is happening in your intellect? What is happening in your emotional center? What's happening in your body? To observe that is an action. To control that is an action. To choose to think is an action. To choose to feel is an action. How we use energy through these five centers creates our life. Everything about ourselves on every level exists in its current condition because of how we use these five centers up till this moment. This is a very profound statement, and I invite you to reflect on it very seriously. You are the consequences of all of your previous actions, not only through your physical body, but through your emotions and your thoughts. Now, all of that, your physical action, your emotional action, and your mental action, were all produced by willpower. You wanted to do it. So you did it. That will is Tiferet here in the center of the tree of life. That is the human soul in Kabbalah. That is taking the energy that's flowing down and using it through thought, emotion, energy, and physicality. Willpower, Tiferet. But what makes will capable of acting? It is the consciousness that flows through it. And that consciousness is Geburah, here on the Tree of Life, even more subtle. And what gives the consciousness existence is the being, the spirit, Atman, our own inner Buddha, who is Chesed on the Tree of Life. And Chesed exists because of these three supernals. So you see this connection of how energy moves through us from the most subtle levels to the deepest. And all of it is here in our five centers, right now. How we choose to act 
and use the energy that we are receiving to give us life. We are in the condition we're in because we've used that energy in a harmful way. If we invert that, adopt a superior action, we can use that energy in a superior form and liberate ourselves from suffering. So that as we liberate ourselves from the addiction to sensation and the filter of the energy and the limitation of emotion and the rigidity of thought, we become willpower, capable of dominating all of those. And that's what's represented in this graphic from Tibetan Buddhism. This monk represents will, the human soul. The human soul that's acting under the guidance of consciousness to liberate itself from suffering. So in this tradition, we emphasize that the, the potential for liberation is not in the future. It is in this moment. And it is a matter of how you choose to use the energy that's flowing in these five centers from moment to moment. It's a matter of choosing superior actions instead of inferior ones. So for that, you have to firstly pay attention. You have to be observing, not thinking about it, not emotionally feeling things about it, and not getting caught up in this physical sensations of it, but consciously observing this whole phenomenon. That doesn't happen automatically or mechanically or on autopilot or just because you heard about it. It is an action of observation. It is an active use of energy from moment to moment to actively observe our way of thinking, our way of feeling, and our way of behaving physically. If we learn to do that, we can change this trajectory not just as a belief or as a theory, but experientially in our daily lives, we will experience it. It is an immutable, infallible law. If we start behaving in superior ways, we will receive superior results. We have a saying in this tradition, if we want to be what we are not, we first have to not be what we are. That means if we want to raise our level of being, if we want to go up to not be a demon or an animal, but to become a real human being and more, we have to first stop being an animal and stop being a demon. We have to renounce those harmful manners of behavior and choose better ones. So to do that for this week, we're going to have some exercises that we can work with. The first one should be pretty obvious to you. Observe yourself. Take it seriously. Make a commitment to really develop the sense of self-observation. It is a sense it is not a belief. It is not a theory. It is not just something that we like and agree with. It is an action that has to be performed continually. And it is not easy, especially in the beginning. It's very difficult because we don't have that sense trained. This is why in this image, in the very bottom, we see the monk trailing far behind the animals. But he's looking towards the animals to observe them. But you also see over here this raging fire. That fire represents how much energy it takes in the beginning. So beginners always tell us, I'm trying to observe myself, but I'm so tired. It's so hard. And they think, oh, I'm doing it wrong. But actually, they're doing it right. It is exhausting. It's like when you first start going to the gym or you first take on a new diet or some other new job something totally new to you that you're not familiar with, it takes a lot of energy to learn. And this takes much more energy 
than any sort of uh, mundane type of endeavor. Because you're not just harnessing your physical senses. You're learning to use your conscious senses. And that energy is much more subtle. And we have very little training, and our society does not encourage this behavior at all. At every turn, society wants us to remain hypnotized, mechanical. Society does not want us to self-observe. So this is the first exercise, to make the effort to develop our self-observation further. The second one is to begin a daily review of what we observed. So every night, at the end of the day, as if you're watching a movie, sit and relax, close all your senses down, and review in your mind's eye the facts of everything you observed that day, as though you're reconstructing a film strip or a movie, like security cameras that recorded everything you did all day. The security camera is your self-observation. You want to record just the facts. Try to remember everything you can. And finally, the third is to begin a spiritual diary. We have prepared a list. It's a short list of questions that you can start to use to stimulate yourself to become more aware of your spiritual life. And uh, we'll provide it to the students here today, and you can also download it. We'll have the link on the website, so you can download that. Uh, this diary, even though it seems intellectually like it's silly, if you actually do it, it will change your life. It will start to point out things to you that you don't want to see. And that's precisely its value. Precisely its value is that it shows you things that you willfully ignore. You can use the spiritual diary in the way that you see fit. If you want to just try it for a week to see how it goes, that's fine. If you don't want to use all the questions, that's fine too. It's just a resource that you can use that's designed to provoke uh, observation. So how far you take that is entirely up to you. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah.